So for the past few weeks, we've been looking at the um, Whisper series, and we did this series a few years ago. So I thought I'd go back, maybe a mistake, and have a look at the preach that I did um, on Revive Church's YouTube channel. I don't watch myself if I can help it. I mean, who likes looking at themselves? That was rhetorical for those of you putting your hand up. But I wanted to see what I'd said last time, so I re-watched it. And I have to say, it was good. I was really impressed. I even laughed at my own jokes. I know, I know. But after listening to it, I knew I either had to preach the exact same thing again or pray for something new. And as Howard felt when he spoke last week, it just didn't settle right with me repeating a preach. And although it would have been a lot easier for me to, than there are a few stories I'm repeating, I did seek the Lord and scriptures for a fresh word. So if you want to hear a great preach, go back to the YouTube me. And today you've got this one, which hopefully will be all right too. Should we just pray? Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word. And Lord, we just ask that anything of me will fall to the ground and anything of you will just penetrate hearts and minds, that you will say what you want to say to each individual here this morning, that it settle within us, that it's here, your teaching for our lives. Bless Gareth and Hannah as they're out ministering as well, Lord. Bless them as they, as they speak your truth and sow seeds into another church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I felt led to look at why listen to the Lord's voice. We've placed emphasis on how, what, when, where to listen to it. But why would we be encouraging you to do this? Why do we feel it's important for you to be able to hear? Well, let's work our way through it as we look at the life of Samuel. 1 Samuel 3 got your Bibles, you can turn to it. So, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am, and he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? My son Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. So for some context, if you read 1 Samuel 1, you can read the account of Hannah, Samuel's mother, who was originally unable to have children, and her battle with prayer and faith, which eventually led to her becoming pregnant with Samuel. Those of you newer to the church won't know, but I have similarities with Hannah, not just a namesake. Matthew and I couldn't have a child, and there's a great testimony um, about that that you can listen back to again on the Revive YouTube from This Is My Story series, where you'll hear that actually some of these verses were instrumental in our own story. And the Lord undertook for us as he did for Hannah by blessing us with a child. And if you read on in chapter one, you discover that once Hannah has weaned Samuel, she then takes him to this temple and presents him to the priest Eli. Now Samuel was to spend the rest of his life in service in the temple. So here is Hannah handing over her firstborn miracle child to the Lord. I'm not sure I could have gone through with that. Although there are moments, like the sleepless nights, the tantrum stage, 
the teenage stage when I think, yeah, maybe I could have. But then they're away for one night and I do miss them. Or two nights, maybe. So Samuel was a priest in the temple, but he also became a prophet to the nation, which we'll look at. And he also was the last judge. So before Israel had a king, it had a series of tribal leaders called judges. So after Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, Joshua, as we heard last week, led them into the promised land. And when Joshua and his generation died, so did the Israelites' knowledge of God. They began worshipping other gods. And that's when the judges came in. But every time a judge died, Israel went astray again, returning to sinful practices and idolatry. And it was a constant cycle of sin and deliverance. So in the book of 1 Samuel 4, we read about Eli being a judge for 40 years, and then, of course, Samuel as judge. And when his sons failed to take on the role, the Israelite people asked him for a king. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a picture of the time in Jewish history when Samuel was alive and what he was dealing with. So for the first point on why listen to God, the answer we're going to look at is for yourself and for your relationship with God. I think the first thing to note is that while Samuel is new to listening to God, not yet familiar with his voice, that he comes under the training of Eli. And it's a really good idea when you're starting off, and at any point really, to have someone in your life who is more experienced than listening to the Lord so that they can provide support and covering for you. They can advise you lovingly, whether you're on track or maybe gone off course a little, which can happen to all of us. There are areas in my life now where I struggle to hear the Lord's voice and I might have to pray with someone else or ask a couple of trusted people to see if they can hear anything for me on whatever the particular matter is. For me, there is a difference in how I hear him depending on what it's for in my life. In the everyday, I read his words through daily devotionals or Bible passages, maybe Christian books or listening to podcasts, and I might hear the Lord challenging me on something or wanting me to learn or grow in an area as common themes start arising in everything I'm reading and listening to. When you keep hearing the same topic over and over again, you have to start paying attention because, you know, the Lord is our best teacher and he's going to draw us deeper and deeper into our relationship with him so that we're becoming more Christ-like and increasing in our knowledge and faith in him to be more effective as his disciples, something we're all called to be going through. It's amazing how you might have read a certain verse so many times and then suddenly one day at the right time in the right season you're going through it'll almost leap off the page at you but I can only hear him speak through the word if I know the word and that's on me to read it and learn it I've heard people say I'm waiting to hear the Lord's will for my life And they're in this sort of stasis, not doing anything, while they're waiting for this booming voice to tell them their life's calling and mission. Well, if that's you, then I can tell you today what his will is, so that you don't waste one more day, because his word is full of what you should be doing. So let me help. We know it's God's will for us to love our neighbors, bridle our tongues, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly, grow in holiness. We know it's God's will that we not murder, steal, cheat, lie, slander, bear false witness, gossip or boast, and that we avoid sexual immorality. We are to give thanks in all circumstances and do good works, to look after the orphans and widows, and of course to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded us. Now, that might not be the exciting answer that you wanted, but if we get those basics right, then at the right time, he'll give you something specific. It's natural, isn't it, to want to know all of God's will at once. But as Gareth shared a few weeks ago, that's not how God usually works. He reveals it to us a step at a time, each move a step of faith, and allows us to continue to trust him. The important thing is that as we wait for further direction, we are busy doing the good that we know we should be doing. 
So as I've learned to do those things, then there are times when he might want me to do something specific and he'll start talking to me about that. And it's like a strong thought that I can't get out of my mind and I know it's not for me. So, for example, a few months before Matthew and I were asked to be life group leaders, the Lord dropped in uh, uh, my heart that we were going to be asked. And before I was asked to join the leadership team, he told me, and this is usually that, so that I've got time to go through a process with him that he knows I need. Then by the time I'm actually asked in person by Hannah and Gareth, I'm not in total shock and running for the hills. Again, for me, that's not a spoken conversation where I hear his voice out loud. Um, but normally, I'll raise my doubts to him in prayer, and he'll answer through his word or something I'm listening to. Then there are times when I've been praying and asking the Lord for something, and he'll start to speak to me about it. I remember talking to a Christian a long time ago before this church when we put our house on the market, and them asking me, where were we thinking of moving to? And I said, well, we're just trying to hear from the Lord on that. And they laughed and said, he's not going to talk to you about every little thing that's going on in your life. That was a major what moment for me. And I was totally confused that if one of the biggest investments you'll ever make financially in your life isn't a big decision, if where I'm going to raise my children, where I'm going to be building relationship with neighbors, if that isn't a big decision that I should ask the Lord about, then what on earth is? Making decisions about potential life partners, about potential employment options, about having children, about what to study and where. These are at least decisions we should be asking the Lord for and listening for the Lord's input on. I actually talk to the Lord about my day and ask him to guide me and protect me and use me in all that I'm about to do. And that might seem over the top to some people, but I'd rather go about my business knowing that I've invited the Lord to be with me in it than see what it looks like without him in it. In fact, up to the age of 28, I did too much without asking him and listening. And I can tell you mess after mess that that resulted in because of that. A bit like the Israelites when they stopped listening to God's appointed judge. You know, Samuel had to learn to listen to the voice for key moments in his life that led to key movement. Like when Saul, who Samuel had appointed to be the first king of Israel, stopped listening to God and a new king had to be appointed. 1 Samuel 15 says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. Maybe you've not been used to listening to the Lord's voice for yourself. Well, it's never too late to start and can bring a wonderful new depth to your relationship. And I actually think it's a necessary step in your relationship with him. It's for all who would call themselves a child of God. So it's not just for the pastors or the leaders of the church or those in full-time ministry, those with a theology degree or those that have been saved a certain number of years. It's for all. John 10 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It also says, And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. That's for any of us in the fold. Jeremiah 33, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. The Holy Spirit living within us is key to knowing that voice. John 16, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He knows who you'll marry, if that's the right path for you. He knows your career choices. He knows where you should live. He knows how to use your gifts and fulfill your purpose on earth. And he's not trying to keep it a secret from you, like some impossible puzzle for you to work your way through. At the right time, as he sees fit, he will lead you and speak to you. So we need to be able to tune into his voice. Something I noticed new when reading through the passages this time was that the Lord actually called Samuel four times before he answers. And it struck me how patient the Lord was, how he kept coming to Samuel, calling him by name and waiting for him to tune into his voice. I believe he's the same today. He knows your name. He's patient with us and he waits for us to hear him. What a loving father we have. 
The key, though, is to make room for the Lord to speak to you. Allow the silence. The Lord loves it when we talk to him in prayer and give him our plans, our fears, our concerns and desires. But can you imagine if someone rang you and then kept speaking, telling you all their news, not pausing for breath, and then when they finished with a, okay, bye then, and hung up. I maybe have been in conversations with people like that. But it works much better if we've got time to respond and speak too, doesn't it? That's what makes a relationship, two people speaking and listening, ladies. So we need to listen to the Lord as well as we speak. And that might look differently for you than it does for me. And I've explained how I hear, and that's okay. Some people experience a voice, not so much an audible voice, but like an inner voice speaking to them. For some, they have dreams, either in their sleep, at night, or daydreams. Some will have visions, as the prophet Joel prophesied in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. If I'm praying and the Lord speaks, then I tend to see a picture or image in my mind and then words explaining what that picture is saying. Or sometimes I can read and see something and my spirit will start to stir. When I was pregnant with Hope, our youngest, there was a time period when the Lord kept speaking to me over and over. He'd already spoken to us clearly about giving us this miracle baby. And now when we were planning her name, he started talking again. I'd chosen a name and I was very happy with it. However, the Lord had other plans. I began to get a sense of a girl's name, which you now know is Hope. Although I wasn't really on board with the name, as it was a bit unusual at the time and it was going to stand out. So I asked for confirmation. And if I ever... Everywhere I turned, there was the name Hope. A magazine came through the door, and it was called Hope. TV program, all about hope. Now, to a certain extent, you can believe that if you read, watch, or listen to Christian things, then the word hope will come up a lot, won't it? But it wasn't just from Christian circles. A fictional book I started reading when I opened it, the main character was called Hope, which was quite unusual for 12 years ago. It literally got quite comical how I was being told over and over again. <clears throat> so did I accept it? No. I asked Matthew to pray into it and see if he heard anything to see if it was right. So it came to one night and Matthew was reading our daily reading. And it was about if you've been waiting for the Lord to bring something that you desired into your life. And it's been painful and hard waiting for etc. which resonated with us. And it ended um, with the line, something like, and the Lord shall give you hope. We laughed and Matthew said, I think the Lord has made it pretty clear that he'd like us to call our baby hope. So I said, yes, it does seem like everything we read or watch has hope in big letters. But maybe we can just ask for one final sign, just one last confirmation. Remember what I said earlier about the Lord being patient? So I was trying to hold on to a different name. So we prayed and asked the Lord to confirm it again. And the next day was a Saturday and my parents were coming over, my mum and stepdad, and we were going to Abergavenny. And we walked into the castle grounds and it was this time of year, so it was surprising that it hadn't rained or there wasn't bit dew over everything and the castle is usually well maintained it's beautiful but obviously the night before some kids must have been out with chalks and there were pictures and writing all over the castle remains and as we walked past one gigantic rock Sophie wanted to climb up on it so Matthew went to help her and then called me over excitedly to see something he'd noticed and as I started walking towards them I gasped because there, as Matthew was pointing out, written across this huge rock was the word hope. This is the photo that Matthew took of that day. I froze. I couldn't believe it. I said, okay, Lord, I hear you. What I would say is the Lord can speak to us however he wants. He's God. We know he's used a donkey. But do start listening before he uses a disembodied hand to write on your wall. 
as Daniel 5, if you don't know what I'm referring to there. So the second reason why you need to be able to hear God's voice is for others. Now, clearly, the Lord would want to speak to them directly, but he knows that on occasion we may need a word from others. That may be in a church setting as he speaks to his body of believers. You may have heard during a service or prayer meeting people sharing what they feel the Lord is saying to us. I know that when I feel led to share a word in a meeting, my heart is beating so fast that it feels like it would just burst out if I don't share it. There's a quickening of your spirit. If you ever feel that but you aren't quite sure, then you can always just ask a leader first who can confirm if it's right to share. Or maybe someone comes up to you directly and says, I feel the Lord is saying this. Or maybe you've asked God for confirmation of something and someone brings it to you. For all of those, we are taught by scriptures to what they say to call weigh the word. And Hannah gave us four great ways to know if it's from the Lord, which were God's voice is always consistent with his character, always consistent with scripture, consistent with love, and consistent with who you were made to be. Some of you might not be aware, but you're already doing it. I know there are times when I felt unconfident or self-conscious, and one of you has come along at that moment and encouraged me right into that situation without being aware, probably. We might also be given a word to share with those not yet Christians, a term I love for those who don't know Jesus yet. When James Way shared with us about how the Lord told him to bring shoes for the homeless man, a few people afterwards told me stories that they'd felt that they should buy um, something and give it to someone or make contact with someone saying something um, specific. And it's exactly what that person, person needed to hear in that moment. So I know that many of you have experiences of this already, which is great. The Lord will use us all, whether we've been saved 60 years, six years, or six weeks, if we're willing and obedient. And he'll use anyone of any age. If we go back to the passage in 1 Samuel, we read on from where Samuel understood it was the Lord speaking. Uh, the Lord gave him a message for Eli that basically said, because Eli's sons were blaspheming God and Eli did nothing about it, that he would punish his family forever. I'm going to go off on an aside here for a minute because it would be easy to gloss over that passage or speak around those verses. But actually, somebody texted me a few weeks ago asking for my wisdom over a matter. And ultimately, what they were saying was, can God tell someone else to tell me that I'm not living my life correctly? So my answer was along the lines of this. Firstly, I don't think the Lord would tell someone else to tell you something that he hadn't tried telling you himself first, probably a few times. But if you're still not listening, he may well use someone else. You see, Eli knew and had been told before about his son's behavior in the previous chapter. I've known in my own life when I was living in a way that wasn't pleasing to the Lord. And it's likely if you are, you already know about it. Secondly, if the Lord did tell someone else, it would typically be someone in spiritual authority over you and or someone who was journeying through life with you, maybe someone you gave accountability to or someone that you trusted and knew loved you and was on your side and wanted the best for you. Thirdly, that person would have to make sure that they were living their life right as we know the teaching about taking the plank out of your own eye before you look at the speck in someone else's. They'd need to tell you out of love, with grace, and hopefully been praying into it already and find the right moment to share it with you. It says in Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so as a friend sharpens a friend. Eli refers to Samuel as son, so we know they've got this close mentoring relationship and he gives him permission, well, he orders him, really, to share what the Lord has said. So my answer to that text was yes, but with the caveats that I've mentioned. And if it was me, I would ask their permission first, too. Okay, so back to the main word. 
We believe that Samuel is about 11 years old when he first hears. And to be fair, I think if I'd have had that word for someone, I would have been afraid to tell them that too at any age. Is Samuel was but a child. And I mentioned this the last time I spoke, but I think it's important to highlight again. You know, we talk a lot about children being the future of the church. And I get that and I agree with that. However, I actually think they are part of the church now also and can play a part in spiritual aspects just as much as the next person. When our church we were part of locally closed down, uh, we were transferred to a church in Caerphilly, which we attended for a while. And the pastor, Roger, one Sunday morning, um, called all the children forward prior to them going out to Sunday school. Now, Hope had just turned four years of age, so Roger scooped her up in his lap, and the other children sat on the stage around him. He asked the children what taking communion was about, and some children put their hand up, including Hope. I started to get a bit uneasy in my seat, because if you've ever spoken to Hope, you'll know our family history within any time at all. So inevitably, Roger said, yes, Hope. And she said, looking out to the crowd, God loves you very much. Roger said, yes, he does. And just as hope came up into my lap, Abba Father wants you to come near to him so he can take you in his arms. Roger said, I'm going to continue now, Hope. Is that okay? But she took the microphone back and said, you don't need to be scared. And went on to talk about darkness and how God will look after you. Now, although Hope had a vocabulary older than her years, I knew this wasn't her typical language in what she was saying. And I had a feeling that it was for someone else. Roger, thankfully, also picked up on that. Maybe the Lord was in this, and he elaborated on her word. After the service, as we went home, I had an impression in my mind that someone had come to the Lord through Hope's words. And when we got in, the telephone rang, and it was Roger. He said, I just wanted to let you know that today we had a lady in the service who would call herself a witch. She was into demonic worship. She'd been battling coming to church for weeks, feeling that she needed to come. She had come in and late and had sat in the back, and she was feeling very uncomfortable. And then Hope said, God loves you. It pierced her heart. And she felt the Lord was talking straight to her. She recognized that it was a higher power than the one she had been in contact with. And then she started panicking, thinking that all the things that she had been involved in, would this God be mad at her? Would she be punished? She thought she ought to leave and was about to, but Hope then started talking about not being scared and that it'd be okay and so on. After the service, the lady had gone up to the pastor and told him this. And so there and then, she gave her life to the Lord. A few weeks later, there was a baptismal service, and the lady asked Hope to be a towel holder for when she came out of the water. It was incredible to witness, incredible testimony to listen to. You know, maybe some of us need to be more childlike in our faith and confidence and obedience. The last reason I'm bringing this morning as to why you should listen to the Lord is for the nation. At the end of 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says, The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all of Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. As the judge and prophet for the nation, he had to hear from the Lord to be able to direct the people and know how and where to lead them, as at times, literally, his life and the life of the Israelites depended on it. Now, I might have struggled with that, personally, to be honest. My gifting is not to be a prophet to the nations, but we still do have prophets today who hear from the Lord and speak into the various nations. Amongst many instructions that the Lord gave Samuel for the nation, as I mentioned earlier, he told Samuel to go and anoint a new king after Saul had failed. Now, Samuel could have felt that he was wise enough by now to judge who would be the right fit for king. But as we're told in scripture, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. 
So Samuel was led to go against the obvious choice, against who the humans would have most likely chosen by listening to God. In 1 Samuel 16, we read, When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Thank goodness. So he asked Jesus, are these all, um, he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And that, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Now, you see, if that was me, I'd be getting to the end of the row and I would have been thinking, oh, come on, Lord, it's got to be this one. Am I even hearing right? Because I've gone through them all and now I'm at the end. Uh-oh. And I wonder how many times in our lives have we looked at the world, at our nation of Wales, our communities, and think, oh, is this it? Now, I've been praying for at least 14 years for a revival for this nation, for an outpouring and a move of the Holy Spirit. And I'm aware of people been praying a good many more years than that. But all I see is darkness growing and humanity falling further away from Jesus and his pattern for their lives. I could look and go, well, that's it then for Wells. I give up. If I wasn't listening, that is. You see, Samuel was listening and knew to ask, was there another son? One who wasn't even considered worthy of the lineup. But God knew there was one who was different to who we might have chosen, one that when his brothers were scared of a giant, along with the rest of the Israelite army, that this one would go slay the giant and save a nation. As I said, I'm not a prophet, but I do, however, pick up on Holy Spirit rumblings, and I get little insights into what the Lord is doing or saying to the nation. And in fact, in my last Samuel word, I even shared something as I went off of my notes, very brave of me, about how revival will come to this nation, in fact, to the world, but not through one person, rather through many Christians everywhere. Since then, I've heard it said over and over again by many different Christians across the globe about it being a move that's going to come that uses lots of Christians who are willing to talk Jesus, willing to share the gospel, and step out in the authority that he's given them. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. You see, if you're listening to God, then you'll hear the small embers starting to burn across this nation. And you'll be able to pray into that, inviting the kingdom into the earthly realm. If you're listening, then you'll be getting yourself prepared, trained up, so that when things grow and spread, you are in the right place, both spiritually and physically, to do your part, whatever that looks like. If you're listening, you'll be able to relate to what Pete Gregg shared at Wildfires this year, which was along the lines of it being the day when Coldplay released their song called We Pray, which in a three-minute song mentions prayer 37 times, cites the Bible and duets with a musician born in Nazareth. This comes hot on the heels of the Olympics, where TV cameras barely knew where to look with so many athletes confessing their faith in Christ. That very same week, the New Statesman, self-described as the leading progressive political and cultural magazine, ran a story cover entitled The Christian Comeback. Meanwhile, Nick Cave released an acclaimed new album entitled Wild God. And since then, we now have Craig David releasing a version of He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. There's been the unexplained spike in church attendance amongst young men in Finland and 12,000 young people baptised in France over Easter. I myself have heard about university students worshipping throughout the night, in some cases worshipping for weeks on end, not wanting to leave the beautiful presence of the Lord. 
In the US, there have been many baptisms in the sea where there are so many. As in California in May, where 12,000 were baptized. I've heard of young men being drawn to just picking up the Bible and reading it. They don't come from Christian homes, they've never been to church, but suddenly they've got a strong desire to find the Bible and read it. Four local to us that I know of. There's been a lean towards requiring God's children to be holy and prayerful and willing to step out for the Lord, even if it costs personally through persecution or in some other way. A seven-year census that is done um, on listening to Jesus, speaking Jesus. Before COVID, one in five were willing to listen to conversations about Jesus. That's now one in three. I believe that the timing of Gareth and Hannah's challenge to us to dig deeper and live higher is all part of a process of getting ready for what is to come. And I, for one, want to be part of that. Don't you? So why do we need to be listening to the Lord? Because our nation needs us to be ready and equipped for when a mighty move of the Lord comes. Because people who are brought into our lives, both Christian and not yet Christians, need us to share with or do the things of the Lord with or for them, literally bringing Jesus to them. And because our own relationship with God needs us to be, to be able to grow and develop in the ways of the Lord. And if you don't, then what a personal relationship you are missing out on with our living God. The streets and shops and restaurants have displays for Halloween at the moment that advertises darkness and evil as fun and exciting. Well, you know, we've got access to speak to and hear from the one true God who reigns over everything. The creator of the universe, the one who is the beginning and the end, can speak to me. He can speak to you directly. I'm not sure there's anything more thrilling or satisfying than that. So let's get prayed up, read up, trained up, and listen up. Let's be people who tune into his voice and say, speak, Lord. For your servant is listening.